Hello Christ community, I wanted to speak to you right at the very beginning of our service, even before the welcome today, uh, in light of the events that have unfolded in Minneapolis, the death of George Floyd, which we watched uh, in, in sickening uh, grief uh, and just an outrage and anger uh, on, on videos posted on social media and everything that's unfolded in Minneapolis since then. And I just want to say right here at the beginning, as someone who is a pastor, uh, as well as I serve as a, a police chaplain, uh, that we do not have to choose between supporting uh, our police officers and law enforcement and also calling for justice to be done and to lament and even experience anger and outrage uh, at injustice. And so right here at the very beginning of our service, I just want to offer a pastoral prayer um, of lament and grief and, uh, and asking God to work. So would you join me in that as we begin? Father in heaven, you are the God of justice and righteousness. And as the psalmist declares, you are the one who executes justice for the oppressed. And we know that your heart breaks over the abuse of power, the devaluing of your image bearers, the evils of racism and injustice in us and around us. And Lord, we ask that you would, by your grace, root out any behavior or belief in us that improperly uh, emplaces any person or people or group below another for any reason. Forgive us, forgive me for our own prejudice, division, apathy, indifference. Father, forgive me for my indifference and apathy. And would you bring reconciling power of the gospel to bear on our hearts, our homes, our communities, our places of business, our nation, and our world. Lord, and we ask that you would do this, Lord, for, for our good, for the joy of all peoples, and for your glory. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Hello, and welcome to the Brookside campus of Christ Community. My name is Kate Jenks, and I serve on staff here in children's ministry. And because of that, I am really missing seeing our little ones and parents on Sunday mornings. But in any case, we are so glad to welcome you to our service today. We want to make sure during this time that we're staying connected with all of you regular attenders and also getting to know any of you who may be worshiping with us for the first time online. We do have an online connect card that we invite you to fill out with your information so that we can get to know you better and serve you in any way that you need. We also invite any of you who may be interested to fill out our online prayer card. So if you have any prayer requests that you would like to share with us, we can pray for them as a staff and follow up with you as well. We do have some events coming up in the life of our church, even while we're at home. 
and included in those are studies for men and women that are starting this week and also I want to remind especially uh, parents to come this afternoon for those who are registered to pick up your faith at home packets all of the details about these events and things happening can be found on our website um, on our weekly update email and also on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Also, be sure to pay attention all the way to the end of this service because we will have contact information, details, and signups at the end of the service on one of the slides. We also wanna make sure that we're utilizing um, the text and greet feature that we've been using while we've been online. What we've been doing is taking this moment to just remember somebody that you miss seeing on Sunday mornings, or maybe if there's someone in your life that you think could really use today's worship service as an encouragement or just a way to get connected. So take this moment, text, say hi to someone, and then when that is done, we'll all come together in worship. morning Brookside campus it's another Sunday and it's a jazz Sunday so I invite you to stand get out of your seat jump and shout and dance with me
May we, who are merely inconvenience, remember those whose lives are at stake. May we, who have no risk factors, remember those most vulnerable. May we, who have the luxury of working from home, remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we, who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close, remember those who have no options. May we, who have to cancel our trips, remember those that have no safe place to go. May we, who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margin at all. May we, who settle in for a quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the key. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the key. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the key. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the key. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the key. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the key. Oh, there be no more crying there. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, 
a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. It's one of Jesus' simplest commands, one of his simplest teachings. And yet, to go and do likewise is one of the most uncomfortable and difficult commands to actually put into practice. Now, if you're uh, like me during this season, we've probably encountered and talked with and spent more time with sort of our immediate neighbors in our neighborhoods than we ever have before. And so at one sense, there's never been a more neighborly time. And yet, have you ever stopped to think about that, that sort of neighborly love is not natural? Where did this idea come from that being a good neighbor is the right thing to do? The sense that you should put yourself at inconvenience or, or even risk giving up resources and time and money uh, that you and your family may need later on in order to help someone else who's not a part of your family, maybe who's even a stranger. It's not as natural as it seems, and it's why it fascinates me. And I remember being in Aldi the weekend that the pandemic really hit in, in Kansas City and in the really across the U.S., and the stock market had been uh, kind of tanking all week long, and there was this sort of rising sense that the job market was going to be really affected and maybe even food was going to be in short supply. And so as I walked into Aldi that morning, the sense of, of like kind of a low-level panic was palpable. I mean, there was this kind of stillness and quiet in the store that was not because there was peace, but because there was this barely contained panic. And it was, we were just figuring out the whole social distancing and dodging one another with our carts, and our eyes were darting to these rapidly emptying shelves. And, and let me tell you, I did not feel a, a great sense of neighborly love oozing off of my fellow shoppers, especially as I walked through the almost empty canned good aisle. And look, I don't blame them. I didn't feel a lot of neighborly love in that moment either. I was just as afraid as they were, many of them. Just being in the store, you soaked up that sense of barely contained panic. But that's my point, right? In those moments, uh, fear and self-protection are what seems like the normal thing to do. It's why we celebrate neighborly love, not because it's normal and natural, but because it's, it's abnormal, right? The natural thing to do in places of fear and panic is to protect yourself. Neighborly love is the opposite of that. It's, it's the unnatural thing to do. And it's deeply rooted in the life and teaching of Jesus, the sense of sacrificial, costly love. And we're going to see that in this passage this morning. And so let's take a look, closer look here at Luke chapter 10. And as we do that, we're going to see this one parable, and then we're going to ask two questions. So one parable, and then two questions. First, the parable. Now, this is one of uh, Jesus' most well-known parables. Kids, if you're watching this with your parents, um, maybe you even ask them just to pause the service. I bet you can retell them the story of the Good Samaritan. It's one of, again, Jesus' most well-known teachings. So maybe pause it right now and just tell them the story of this Good Samaritan parable. 
Now, even if you're just joining church online, or maybe you've been away from church for a long time, I suspect at least that you've heard the idea of a good Samaritan, uh, and you might even have some familiarity with this story that Jesus tells. Uh, it's one of his most famous teachings. Now, uh, that's important to recognize that it is called a parable, because unlike some of Jesus' other popular teachings, say the Sermon on the Mount, this is not a sermon. It is a parable, and a parable is really just this sort of extended metaphor uh, that invites our imaginations into a story, into a world in, in which they are caused to think differently about things. And in this way, parables communicate much more like poems and paintings than they do term papers or infographics. They communicate much more like a poem or a painting that works on your imagination rather than in this kind of straightforward, linear fashion like a term paper or an infographic. And so this morning, as we look at this parable, we, we note that they are, in many ways, they're deceptively simple, and sometimes they're simple, and they're often mystifying at first. In fact, this is why Jesus used them. If you were captured by the story, you could lean in, you could press in and find out more, but if you had a hardened heart toward Jesus and what he was about, you could just sort of listen to the story, well, that's a cute story, Jesus, and just move on. And this particular story, one of the ways, and this is true of actually of all parables, that you want to get at the meaning of this, both for Jesus' original listeners, as well as what is the significance then for the, uh, us today, um, is the way that you go about doing that is to look at not just the parable itself, but also the context uh, of the parable. So what is happening in the gospel uh, that causes Jesus to share this parable at this moment? And here, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, it is a tricky question from a religious scholar, from a religious lawyer, an, an Old Testament expert, that prompts Jesus to tell the story. The man comes to Jesus and he says this, verse 25, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers this expert's question with another question. He says, verse 26, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now let's just pause here and say that the question the lawyer asks, it's, it's a flawed question from the beginning, right? He asked the question, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? But here's the thing, you don't do anything to earn an inheritance. No, an inheritance is not something you do things to earn. An inheritance is something you receive because of who you are. Right? The answer to the question, how do I inherit Bill Gates' fortune? The, the answer is you don't do anything, nothing. <laughs> You have to be or become a child of Bill Gates, a relative of his, to receive the inheritance of his fortune. It's a flawed question from the beginning. And this is why Jesus throws the question back to the lawyer and says, well, you're an expert in the law. What does it say? How does, do you read it? And this guy quotes Jesus' response back to him. Jesus, in all of his teaching around Judea and Galilee, this is how Jesus was summarizing the law and the prophets. He says, this is it. Love God with everything that you have, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer is quoting Jesus' own summary of the law back to him. And, and Jesus uh, understands in this moment. He's, the lawyer is saying, Jesus, isn't this what you teach? And Jesus understands this guy is trying to trick him. This was a strategy of many of the religious leaders at that time who were opposed to Jesus. They tried to get him to trip up in something he would say to contradict the Old Testament law. But Jesus is brilliant, and he see this coming, sees this coming a mile away. Good work, he says. Just go ahead and do that. But the lawyer won't be put off that easily. He knows it is just words that are, or rather, he knows words are just sounds, right? The words are just sounds unless you define them. Words are just sounds unless you define them. So, desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And it's in response to that question that Jesus tells this story of the Good Samaritan. Now, though, before we look at that story, we have to recognize what was in that religious scholar's mind when he asked the question about neighboring. And I think Kenneth Bailey does a great job here. He says, as a good first century Jew, he expects Jesus to respond with the list the lawyer hopes he can manage. The neighbor will naturally include his fellow Jew, who keeps the law in precise fashion, 
Gentiles are not neighbors, and everyone knows that God hates Samaritans and so certainly do not qualify as neighbors. And again, this is a disturbing story, um, but we often miss how disturbing it is, the parable that Jesus tells, because we're so familiar with it. In fact, uh, when I was uh, in college, one summer I was part of, believe it or not, I was part of a gospel music group. I was a, a vocalist in this group, and we would travel around to churches all throughout the summer, and we would perform. And in those concerts, we would always at some point in the middle take a break, and we would perform kind of a slapstick skit version of this parable. And it, it undermines how disturbing, deeply disturbing it is. Because it's the story of someone who is beaten so badly that they are dying. That they are about to die. Even the video of the scripture reading we watched at the beginning here has to sort of sanitize it a little bit to avoid it being an R-rated clip. But actually, in some ways, what happens in the beating is the least disturbing part of the story. It's what happens next that should really shake us up. Verse 31, now by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Right, the temple, it's important to recognize here as we think about who this priest is walking down the road. The temple was the heart of Jewish worship, the heart of Jewish life. And it had a hierarchy of people who served in it. There were the priests who were the top level and then the, the Levites who were the next sort of hierarchy level down. And then there were also Jewish laymen who served and did tasks around the temple as well. And so Jesus sets this up. We have the kind of the hierarchy, uh, the highest level of that coming down the road. Now notice the text doesn't say he's walking. He says he's going down the road. And Jesus' listeners would have likely pictured this man on an animal of some kind a donkey going down because uh, the priests at this period of time in history were wealthy. And so it was unlikely he would have been walking. And so Jesus is here as they're imagining the story and picturing it. They're sort of imagining this priest riding down the road in his S-class mule Sadie's Benz. And he gets to the point where this man is beaten on the side of the road and he passes by. Why? And what's the point of making this big deal about him having an animal? Well, first, if he had an animal, he would have had an easy way to transport this guy, but he doesn't. Why? Well, a couple of things there. First, in the ancient world, in this part of uh, Israel-Palestine, most people looked very similar. Even if they were of a different tribe or ethnic group, um, they physically looked very similar. The way that you told people apart was by how they dressed, and then even the, the language they spoke or even the accent that they used. So their, their dress, their language, their accent, that's how you discern, is this person part of my group or an outsider or a Gentile, someone different? And so this priest, he encounters a man who doesn't have any of those things. He is naked, so there's no clothing to discern. And he's unconscious, so there's no language or accent. And so the priest says, look, I don't understand. I don't know if this guy is part of my group or not. Is he a Jew? Is he a Gentile? Is he a Samaritan? I don't know, and I'm not about to risk myself in a certain a situation of such uncertainty of touching someone who might be unclean, who might make it impossible for me to do my work at the temple, who maybe is even dead. I'm just going to pass on by. Then the next person in the hierarchy comes walking down the road, and it's a Levite, and he's not quite as affluent, so he probably is hoofing it, he's walking, and he comes to this man. Now, he knows that the priest would have been on the road ahead of him, right? Maybe they had just been serving together in Jerusalem. And if the priest, who was his sort of vocational and hierarchical, right, his vocational and socio uh, kind of hierarchy above him in this, if the priest who was just here passed by, why should he, a Levite, stop? And in fact, even if he did feel some kind of twinge of compassion that maybe he should stop, wouldn't it bring shame on the priest to, to kind of show him up, if you will? It, that's not done. And so he passes on by. Now, given the priest, the Levite, that progression, now what every one of Jesus' listeners is expecting to hear is expecting the next character to be, and now is this Jewish layman comes walking down the road. And maybe he's going to be sort of the unexpected hero, the, the everyman who, who triumphs where the, the hierarchy failed. But here's where there is a shocking turn in the story. There is a shocking, unexpected hero in this moment. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, 
Not a Jewish layman, but a Samaritan as he journeyed, came to the place where he was and he saw him and he had compassion, verse 34, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he, he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now again, the Jews hated the Samaritans ethnically, religiously, and so it was shocking to their every sensibility that Jesus has an unexpected turn and makes this guy the hero. And, and rather than just seeing the man and passing by, he sees him and he has compassion on him. And that word is, is rare. It has the idea of this sort of deep gut level feeling of concern and compassion and empathy for the plight of another and not only does the Samaritan risk his life on the road, stopping at apparently a dangerous place where people are getting robbed and beaten up, and he gives first aid to this guy, he puts him on his animal, and he takes him to an inn. Now, we just kind of gloss over that detail, but that was a really dangerous thing for him to do. Why? He is a hated Samaritan taking an almost dead, beat-up Jewish man into a Jewish village. That would be an incredibly risky thing to do. Because every Jew in that village, when they see a Samaritan coming into town with a beaten up, dead or almost dead Jew, every preconceived notion, prejudice they would have would say he was the one who did that to him. He's not the hero. He is the perpetrator of this violence. And they would have immediately moved to enact sort of a communal justice on this person without even hearing the story, right? You can imagine uh, 1950s, Jim Crow South, a black man drives into the white part of town with a naked, beaten white woman in the back seat. What is the assumption of the story that's going on? Even in 2020, Ahmaud Arbery can be shot and killed for merely looking like a burglar. This was an incredibly risky move of the Samaritan to take this wounded Jewish man into a Jewish village looking for an inn. Nobody listening to Jesus tell this story would have expected this turn. Nobody wants it. And then Jesus asks, who was a neighbor to this man? Now, note that was not the lawyer's question. The lawyer's question is, who is my neighbor? Jesus does not answer that question directly. Jesus' assumption is, everyone is your neighbor. Any human being, any image bearer is your neighbor. No, Jesus' question is, who became a neighbor? Who was a neighbor to the man? The neighbor is the Samaritan. And if you only remember one thing out of the sermon today, I hope it is this, that the question is not, who is my neighbor? Jesus says, every image bearer, every human being is your neighbor. The answer, or the, the question rather, is not, who is my neighbor? The question rather is, how do I become a neighbor? Not, who is my neighbor? But, how do I become a neighbor? That's the parable. Now for the two questions that help us sort of get at the significance of this for our lives. First, the question is, who are we seeing? Second, the question is, how are we serving? So who are you seeing? How are you serving? First, who are you seeing? And the fundamental, uh, again, answer to this question, who is my neighbor, is any fellow image bearer. And the accent, though, that Jesus placed here is on not who is my neighbor, but how do I become a neighbor? And becoming a neighbor is wrapped up in who we see. And I don't just mean who passes before our field of vision. That's what happened with the priest and the Levi. I mean, who do we see with the compassion and love and heart of Jesus? And one of the things that this pandemic, I think, has highlighted for many of us is how isolated or insulated we are from one another economically and medically. Far and away, the pandemic has affected both medically and economically those who are lower income and minority peoples in our country. For example, earlier in May, the Federal Reserve published a study that showed that in March, 40% almost of people who lost a job made less than $40,000 a year. A harsh economic impact. And Dr. Re uh, Rex Archer, the director of the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department here in Kansas City, where the Brookside campus is, has pointed out that nearly 50% of people getting positive COVID tests are African Americans, even though they only make up 30% of the city's population. Uh, and similarly, in Johnson County on the Kansas side, nearly 13% of people receiving positive tests are black while they only make up 5% of the population. 
And stats and percentages are one thing, but each one of those percentages represents a person, represents a story, represents a neighbor who Jesus loves, who Jesus died for, who Jesus gave his life for. Recently, I was on a Zoom call with our partner school, King Elementary, and the vast majority of that leadership team at King Elementary is African-American women. And as we were going around the circle, sort of uh, sharing our stories and how we were doing and updates in the midst of the pandemic, it was sobering to listen to the stories of these women. Because not only had many of them lost their jobs or their husbands had lost their jobs, but also not only did many of them know someone who had been infected with the virus, every single one of them knew someone who had died of COVID-19. That's very different than my experience. But for so many of us, while we do see the statistics on the news, we rarely see and know the image bearers those statistics represent. They're just a number. And becoming a neighbor starts with entering into relationship with people who are different from us. There is no them in the kingdom of God. There is only us. So who are you seeing? And are you seeing them as God does? If we see them as God sees them, we will love them no matter who they are. Loving our neighbor near and far does not mean that we agree with everything they believe or do. It doesn't mean that we stop being discerning of good and evil. It doesn't mean that all human beings will eventually have the same eternal destiny. However, it does mean that we love God by loving our neighbor no matter who they are. Even the unlovable neighbor we may encounter, whether that's across the street or across the world, our neighbor is anyone who is an image bearer who is in need. And as followers of Jesus, we are commissioned even to love our enemies. And let's not forget either that our ultimate enemy does not have flesh and blood, but is the evil one, the spiritual forces of darkness. Who are you seeing? And are you seeing them like Jesus? So that's the first question. Who are you seeing? Second, how are you serving And let me just say here, there are many ways of serving as there are people to be served, right? As many image bearers are there to be served, there's ways to serve. So get creative, right? And just even think about this. Whoever lives with you in your house, if you live with someone else, whether that is a friend, a spouse, a roommate, a child, they are your first and foremost, your neighbor, and where you can practice this, right? Kids, if you have a brother or sister living at home, your first and foremost neighbor is them, and you should seek every day to do something kind for them, to encourage them, to help them. Once you start looking for ways to serve, you begin to see ways to serve everywhere. Now let me just give you then three categories to kind of animate our imaginations around what it could look like to serve in this kinds of way. So one would be working, second would be caring, and then third would be sharing. So first, working. Right? As followers of Jesus commissioned to serve our neighbor, one of the primary places we do that is through our work, right? Don't overlook the work that you do every day, whether that's paid or unpaid, whether it was work you do in the home or work you do from home these days. That work is often the primary way that you love and care for your neighbor. Whether it's emptying the dishwasher or going to the hospital to care for sick patients, that work, the work of your hands, is the way that God has organized the world for you to love and to serve your neighbor In many cases, right, we've been celebrating, as we should, those industries and workers who have been deemed essential in this time. And if you're one of those, if you're a first responder or someone delivering food or packages or working at a hardware store or in retail or a grocery store, uh, medical field, all of those, if you are one of those folks, we are eternally grateful for you. And yet, in another sense, we recognize that really all work is essential work and that it provides for someone's needs financially or in providing service for those who are in need. Every job is essential. Every person's work, paid or unpaid, is essential to the flourishing of their world. So working. Second, caring. And this is where I think so many of us discovered afresh in this time 
The power of caring, the sending of a text, an email, a phone call, a card in the, in the, in the mail. I, I don't know how many cards and letters and treats our kids have exchanged with neighbors on our block during this time. Right? Or the, the time that our, our whole sort of block came together to help celebrate a, a little boy's birthday. And we all set out banners and balloons and streamers and cheered as he sort of paraded around the block. These are opportunities for caring. And when we do those things, people feel seen and they, they feel dignity and they, they feel loved and known and cared for. Caring is an incredible way to serve. So working, caring, and then finally, uh, sharing. And sharing is really at the heart of all serving. You can't ca- uh, serve without sharing in some way. Your time, your attention, your energy, your focus, your, your financial resources. And in this time, right, people are hurting financially, and sharing is more important than ever for all of us, right? And first, continue, encourage you, continue to be generous to the local church. At Christ Community, we are setting aside as well as distributing more uh, benevolence funds than I think we ever have in our history, which at one level, it's painful to hear those stories. At another level, it's an incredibly uh, joyful moment as a church to be able to meet those needs. And your generosity enables us to do that. Uh, Second, I'd encourage you to continue to give generously above and beyond to our ministry partners here in the city. Uh, whether that's uh, Christian Fellowship Baptist Church, whether that is Mission Adelante, uh, the Hope Center, you can go onto our website, see partner organizations of Christ Community, consider making an extra gift to them as they're doing incredible work to serve in this time. Also, think of ways, how can you support local businesses? Right? Maybe you can't go to a restaurant yet, your favorite one to dine in, uh, or maybe you're not comfortable doing that yet, but Maybe you go ahead and and keep ordering takeout or think of a way that a local business might supply your item rather than just clicking buy now on Amazon. This is part of the way that we serve is by sharing our resources in these ways. I was really challenged by what it means to serve and to share lately uh, when one morning I was going through my email and my four-year-old daughter Isla was with me. And I didn't even really realize she was paying attention to what I was doing, but I was going through my email and I watched the financial update video from our two senior pastors, Tom and Mark, that came out a while ago. And I guess she was watching it as I sat there at my desk. And I closed the email, went on to some other work, and she left and went and did something else. But a few minutes later, she came back in the room carrying two bags of coins. She said, Dad, I want to give these to Pastor Tom and to the church. And then she got it. I started tearing up because she brought, she went down to her room and found two bags of coins that I want to give these to Pastor Tom in our church. That's that heart of generosity, of sharing. She wanted to care in that way. Working, caring, sharing. Jesus told the lawyer, do this and you will live. And that's right, but the only way that we can do that and live is to be made new through faith in Jesus, where we actually get his perfect record and we get the Holy Spirit who actually comes and indwells us, who gives us new life and then empowers us to serve and to trust and obey. When you're in Jesus, you get forgiven of all the ways that you fail to serve and to love like this, that bring death on your neighbors. You get restored into this this newness of life because, you know, see, Jesus is both the man on the the road who his body is broken and his blood is shed and he is also the ultimate good Samaritan who has come to rescue us, the unexpected hero who came to save you. And you see, Jesus wasn't beaten in a surprise attack. No, he planned before the foundations of the world from all eternity to come and to give his life to rescue you because he loves you and he sees your need, he sees your plight, and he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to save you and I'm going to give my life. No one's going to take it from me. I'm going to willingly give it to you. And when we celebrate communion, it's that whole big story that we remember and we savor and we celebrate. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you have communion elements with you, now would be a great time to do that. Also, you can feel free to pause the service if you need to go grab those and get them set up. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had broken, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and he said, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat, Savor the good news of the gospel.
let's remember to let our light shine wherever we are. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Just as Jesus called us in that passage that was preached on from Luke to love our neighbors as ourselves, we're also called to love our broader communities and our cities. We're called to love our city even in a time of fear, even in a time where we might feel like exiles in our own homes. So for the benediction today, I'm going to read a passage from Jeremiah 29 verses 4 through 7. And I'm going to invite you to raise your hand as a sign that you're receiving this word. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay in them. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children and then find spouses for those children so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for the city's welfare will determine your welfare. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week.